from a rainbow of flavored chocolates to regional treats, Japanese sweets and snacks are tasty and great to look at. Many are shaped as plants, animals, and other natural motifs, a hallmark of Japanese design. Various kinds of snack food became widely sold more than a century ago when Western-style sweets started to be made in Japan. At some schools these days, sweet making is being applied as a teaching aid. And sweets are even being used to battle dementia in the elderly. <laughs> This time on Japanology Plus, sweets and snacks. We'll explore how these tasty treats are woven into Japan's way of life. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus, I'm Peter Varakan. And these excellent potato crisps have just come out of the fryer over there, they're still warm. I'm in a shopping arcade in the basement of Tokyo Station. And this area here has several shops operated by Japan's major confectionery companies. There are some items that are only available at certain times of the year, others that are regional varieties. For example, these chewy candies here come in all kinds of different flavors from all over Japan. These melon ones are from Hokkaido in the north. Down here we have sikwasa, which is a citrus fruit that's from Okinawa. Normally these would be available each in its own region, but if you come here, you get the whole lot. You can imagine this place is a big hit with tourists, both from Japan and from outside too. Japan's sweets and snacks industry is currently valued at something like 3.5 trillion yen per year, which is a tenfold increase over 30 years ago. And there are dozens of new items that hit the shelves in supermarkets and convenience stores every month. Why so much variety? Let's start off with a look at current trends. We begin our tour of Japan's sweets and snacks industry today with a shop devoted to them. The shelves are packed with all kinds of snacks and sweets, about 5,000 different products. Three main categories are stocked by shops like this or by supermarkets. First, there are evergreen brand name products, including chocolate, gum, and various types of snacks. Many have been on the market for decades. Japanese chocolate ranks among the best in the world, and the huge variety of chocolate products includes a lot of flavored items. Japan also has a vast range of savory snacks. The perennial favorites include senbei, rice crackers, which come in various forms. Category two. Snacks or sweets sold at certain times of year or in certain areas. The defining feature of seasonal products is a seasonal flavor. In the autumn, many products feature chestnut, a classic seasonal flavor. Regional limited edition products use flavors that represent the region. This candy is flavored like miso ramen, something Hokkaido is famous for. And category three, newly launched products. More than 2,000 snacks and sweets come on the market each year, aiming to catch ever-shifting taste trends. Chocolate featuring lactic acid bacilli capitalizes on a recent fad for fermented foods thought to aid digestive health. And these chewy treats have a coating of collagen, which is said to be great for the skin. Right now, products with a health or beauty angle are especially popular. Japanese snacks and sweets are gaining popularity overseas. Many foreign visitors now buy them to take home. What's the appeal? I love Japanese snacks and sweets. Texture. Great texture. 
The chewy ones are so soft, sweet, and juicy. Delicious. The taste is, is very good. And it's very famous in Hong Kong people, among Hong Kong people. And that is why uh, we always uh, go to supermarket to get those um, Japanese uh, snacks. Recently, makers of snacks and sweets have developed a new sales strategy. They are putting packs of their products in offices. This is a service the makers now offer to companies. A supply of snacks and sweets restocked weekly. The items are 100 yen each. Employees pay using an honesty box. Around 100,000 companies are offering this perk to their employees, and the number is growing quickly. I'll buy something when I have to work late. And when I need to take a break, I'll buy something then too. At home or at the workplace, sweets and snacks are part of today's Japanese lifestyle. I'm in Ueno, in pretty much central Tokyo now, and there's a street where I am now called Ameyoko. Snacks to the right of me, sweets to the left of me. It's, I mean, th this whole place is just full of this stuff. And there's this enormous shop here, which I'm going to go into now. And I'm going to go in with my guest for today, Mr. Eiji Tatsugi. Thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Nice to meet you. Today's guest, A. Chief Tatsugi, is an expert on the marketing and culture of Japanese snacks and sweets. Let's see what treats we have in store. The sheer number of the items for sale is absolutely mind-boggling in here. But apart from that, what would you say is different about Japanese snacks from things that you find in other countries? The key features of Japanese snacks, well, uh, look at some of these ones here. Bamboo shoots, mushrooms, seafood. These reflect Japanese motifs. Japan loves seasonal flavors and foods that appeal to the eye as well as the taste buds. When it comes to food, including snacks and sweets, we want to engage all five senses when we eat something. Sight, sound, texture, as well as smell and taste, of course. What sets Japanese snacks and sweets apart is how they target all five senses. That's the way I see it. I understand eyes and mouth, but what about ears? When you bite into something and it crunches, it seems tastier because of that sensation. So the makers aim for that when they make the product. Oh, oh. In Japan, we have various gift-giving customs, and nice things to eat are common choices. These days, people can give upscale versions of everyday snack foods in fancy packaging. Okay. I mean, these things have been around forever, and they're very nice, too. I mean, they're just basically uh, shrimp-flavored crackers. And absolutely fine, but a very inexpensive snack. You, it's not something you're going to want to give to somebody for a gift, so the makers have decided that, OK, we're going to package it a bit better and actually change. I mean, I'm assuming that the, the contents are a bit different as well. It's quite a good idea, yeah. But why is there such a huge variety of sweets and snacks in Japan? Back in the old days, each feudal domain had to raise its own funds. Regional products were one way they did that. Just copying each other's hits would lead to everyone losing money, so every domain produced a unique variation. Say that different domains made manju, a sweet bun. Each type would have a different filling. Lumpy sweet bean paste, maybe, or smooth sweet bean paste. There were sweet potato fillings, purple yam fillings, fruit fillings. Each domain developed its own to differentiate its products. That's, that's a little surprising for 200 years or more ago. Yes, the marketplace strategy of product differentiation has a long history. Snacks and sweets became widely available when Japan opened to trade in the 19th century, bringing imports of Western sweets such as chocolate and caramels. 
As Western sweets became popular, Japanese producers sprang up to make them. Cookies, marshmallows, and many more. Although expensive, they quickly took off. Later, in the 1930s, as Japan plunged deeper into war, resources became scarce. With sugar being rationed, production of sweets dropped and they became unavailable to the general public. Factories were switched to production of emergency rations. But they did make sweets fortified with vitamins and minerals to distribute to soldiers. After the war, the situation changed dramatically. In the 1960s, Japan's economy boomed and prosperity increased. Home appliances and cars became common. Families would gather around the television and together they would drink tea and eat sweets or snacks. Large bags of potato snacks or rice crackers became popular with the whole family. The late 1980s saw the peak of Japan's bubble economy and soaring prosperity. Demand grew for premium, elegant sweets. Chocolates made from the finest ingredients were all the rage. There was also a broad assortment of niche products, such as snacks in super spicy flavors. In the late 1990s, as the workforce diversified, so did food choices. There was greater demand for snack foods that could be thought of as meal substitutes. Packaging for snacks and sweets was improved to protect them from crumbling while being carried around. Entering the 21st century, a health-conscious trend swept Japan. Accordingly, sweets and snacks that were additive-free, non-fried and low-calorie flooded the market. Sweets and snacks continue to mirror social trends in Japan. We're going to visit an old-fashioned sweets manufacturer in Tokyo. It just looks like a regular house. Many snack and sweet makers in Japan are family businesses like this. This one makes a penny candy called Ankodama, which dates from way back. Try one. Mm. Mm. It's a really simple kind of sweet. I mean, it's like beans, some water, some sugar. That's about it. Exactly. Beans cooked and made into paste, shaped and powdered. Very simple. Let's take a look inside. OK. This tiny facility has just five employees, but its sweets are sold nationwide. Hello, thank you very much for letting us come in today. Yoroshiku onigaishimasu. Glad you could come. How long have you been making these sweets here? About 80 years. Wow. Since 1929. Oh, and you're still making the same thing now? Almost unchanged. Let's see how these sweets are made the good old-fashioned way. Japan-grown azuki beans are mashed and mixed with water, starch syrup and sugar to make red bean paste. That's, it looks like a lot of sugar, although, in fact, when I tried one just now, it wasn't that... I mean, it's sweet, but not ridiculously sweet. Well, that may be how you see it, but it does contain quite a lot of sugar. <laughs> the sugar also serves as a preservative, so the product keeps longer. Ours are good for three months with no refrigeration. Because of the sugar? Yes, they keep. OK, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> we watch TV to get the one-week weather forecast. If we see it's going to be raining in a certain part of the country, we add less water and make a slightly firmer paste for the product we ship there. We tailor the moisture content to the weather, so our product always tastes its best. So, so wait a minute, you're shipping out the same, these same sweets to every different district in Japan, yeah. and you have to adjust the amount of water 
to the, the weather conditions in each district every day. Correct. Oh my God, that's incredible. The red bean paste is kneaded by hand to drive out air and achieve uniform texture. A machine turns out rods of paste. These are covered in roasted soybean flour, kinako, and cut into smaller pieces, which are rolled into bite-sized balls. Finally, the anko dama are boxed and powdered again to add flavor and fragrance. What's the price? Our products? Well, when I was a boy 70 years ago, they were 10 yen a piece. Oh. And mostly they still are. Oh. How do you manage to keep the price down to what it is? We buy the ingredients in bulk to get the best possible price. That's all we can do. And we cut other costs as much as we can. Things like electricity and labor. I was actually amazed that it's a, just a very simple, old, traditional sweet, but there's so much that goes into it. For centuries, Japanese snacks and sweets have been thoughtfully crafted for maximum appeal. Here's a famous style of snack that comes in 18 flavors. Oh, wow. The length, the size of the hole, that maker has carefully optimized everything for easy munching. And it's intended to appeal to people of all ages. These days, you can win snacks as prizes in amusement parks, and you can even buy them in bookshops. Why bookshops? I suppose it's because they're places where parents shop with their children. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Alt, and on today's episode of Plus One, I'm going to be learning about the traditional Japanese art of candy sculpture. Now, in this way of candy making, you take a viscous sugar syrup and mold it by hand, then cut it with scissors to make amusing shapes. It sounds pretty tricky, but it turns out there's a place here in Asakusa that's going to show me how it's done. Can I make it as a candy maker? There's only one way to find out. Hmm, sweet. Matt visits a candy maker in Tokyo's Asakusa district. Wow, this place is cool. Oh, and look at all this stuff on display. Look at these fish. Goldfish, squid, octopi. These don't even look like candy. This is amazing. They look like the real thing. This is Mr. Tezuka, and he's going to show me how this is done. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. How do you make these wonderful candy sculptures? Let me give you a basic explanation. See this pot of molten candy? Just uh, sugar, water, and uh, starch? Starch syrup is the main ingredient, along with various sugars, but mainly starch syrup. So what, what are we going to make first? We'll make the most basic item, a rabbit. A rabbit, very nice. The rabbit is the first shape you learn when you are apprenticing to be a candy sculptor. So this is level one. The candy will harden in about three minutes, so you have to work fast. First, the candy is plucked by hand to form the head and shears are used to make the ears. Then the front legs. The shears are used like tweezers to shape them. Then comes the bobtail and the hind legs. Now it's Matt's turn. First, he makes the rabbit's head. OK, snip it right away. So I'm going to first the ears, correct? Make the two ears, open up your shears wide, make a nice deep snip. Ah, I see. That's how you have to do it. So wider, wider, now cut. And then... Ah, interesting. The candy is drooping, so turn it sideways a little. And move it up and move the ears out a little bit. Now shake the ears. So what I want is to get a little bit of the bottom here, correct? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, don't cut that. Pinch it. Get the shape right. Hurry, it's drooping. <laughs> okay. Oh, he's falling down. 
How about the legs? Snip apart the front legs from underneath, like this. It's hardening fast, so hurry. Yes, there and there. Oh, it's hard. It's getting hard. Hurry to the next step. The tail. Now round this off, like you're pushing it in, quickly. Now snip out the legs before it hardens. Here I go. Oh, it's hard already. This is very hard. Oh, it's hard. Okay. Now pull this out. Matt barely manages to finish his creation in time. Mr. Tezuka's looks like a rabbit. Mine, on the other hand, looks like a certain world-famous pocket-sized monster. Once the shape is formed, food coloring is used to paint the eyes, nose, and mouth. Well, that looks more like a rabbit. Nice work. Cute. Thank you so much for showing me how to make candy sculpture. You're welcome. Good job. Well, there you have it. Next time you're in Japan, why don't you drop by a candy workshop and give traditional Japanese candy sculpture a try. Until then, see you next time. Mm. Across Japan, new initiatives based on sweets and snacks are being tried. This is a primary school in Miyagi Prefecture. A class of 30 first and second graders are enjoying an unusual chemistry lesson. Did you notice how your powder was white, but gradually changed color? Yours is blue? It's all gooey, and I think the color's changed. They're experimenting with something they love, candy. They learn about acids and bases and other chemical properties while making sweets. The class happens once a year and everyone looks forward to it. The various tasks involved cultivate knowledge and creativity and the children can enjoy the sweet taste of success. How is it? Yummy. Do you like this class? It's fun. They love making candy, and this activity helps them understand chemistry. They find this very rewarding. When the theme is something children can relate to, they really pay attention. We plan to keep this going. Sweets and snacks let children have fun as they learn and acquire thinking skills that will serve them as they grow up. This is a home for the elderly in Ishikawa Prefecture. It's another site for a sweets-based initiative. Inside is a penny candy stall like those once found on every street corner. This one sells goodies at pocket change prices, just like the old days. The elderly residents can purchase products that remind them of their youth. The idea is that reminiscing will stimulate the brain and thus slow down the cognitive decline that accompanies aging. Initiatives like this are now being implemented in nursing homes across Japan. At this nursing home, a penny candy stall and a cafe were opened 14 years ago. Elderly residents buy penny candy and take it to the cafe, where they eat it and chat about days gone by. Masami Kawakami is 99 years old. Give her some candy and the memories come flooding back. We could buy two for a penny or three for a penny if we went to the place where they made them. I still remember that. The candy makes more of a difference than you'd imagine in stimulating recollections of the past. I think this program is great. I'm glad we introduced it. These days, 
fighting dementia with sweets and snacks is an idea that is also drawing attention beyond Japan. We've come up to the northeastern edge of Tokyo, a place called Kosuge. This is a small neighborhood sweet shop and a very old traditional kind. It kind of takes me back to the days of my youth, actually. Welcome. Konnichiwa. When I was a kid, we used to have similar kind of things. And I think just to a certain extent, you still find them. For sweets like this, prices range from 5 to 30 yen. Even pocket money is enough to buy them. For many children of my generation, it was the first purchase we ever made for ourselves. You'd practice your arithmetic and learn how to use money. And talking to the sweet seller helps children learn social skills. Mm. Mm. How long have you been in business here? About 63 years. Wow. And uh, most of your customers small children? Yes. They're mainly primary school children. I love it when someone I knew as a small child comes by to tell me they got married. Oh. Wow. <laughs> OK. As we've seen, there have been all sorts of initiatives to produce new products of all different kinds. What's happening at the moment to deal with these social changes? Right now, sweet and snack makers are eager to reach markets outside Japan, using Japanese technology to tailor treats to the tastes of various foreign markets. For example, a Japanese snack in a Tom Yum Kun flavor was made for the Thai market. Okay. Japanese food technology delivers a really delicious Tom Yum Kun taste or products that meet the dietary requirements of certain religious beliefs. Chocolate, for example, contains animal fats, which are a problem for some consumers. It's possible to replace animal fats with vegetable-based items. Eggs are another ingredient to stay away from in some markets. To win sales in each market, you have to give customers peace of mind. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Hairdressing showcases Japan's outstanding service, and hair salons are constantly evolving to offer the customer an even more enjoyable experience. <laughs>